All right, welcome everybody to this latest edition of Unfinished Business, and this is a very special interview episode like we like to do uh, on a regular monthly basis or bi-monthly basis. I'm your co-host, Andre Joseph, HAFX Productions. As always, the main man himself, the real host of the show, Mr. Jeff Gallishaw. Hey, everybody, I am here. And we have a very special guest today that I've known for pretty much over a decade now. His name is Paul Talbot. And Paul is the author of the books Bronson's Loose, the making of the Deaf Wish films, Bronson's Loose Again, the sequel book, which is on the set with Charles Bronson. He's also written Mondo Mandango, the Falconhurst books and films, uh, the films of Dion quadruplets, as well as articles and magazines for Video Watchdog, Cinema Retro, Psychotronic, the films of the Golden Age. And you've contributed a number of liner notes, extras, and DVD uh, commentary tracks, which I also happen to be a fan of and we'll talk about in a bit. And uh, I actually have my copy of Bronson's Loose right here, which is how I first met you. I found it on Amazon back in 2008, and I don't know what sparked the interest. I think I was writing a vigilante film similar to this. And when I saw this come across, like I had seen the Death Wish movies when I was much younger, like when I was actually in eighth grade. And here in New York, we have Channel 11, and they would do the marathons every once in a while, where like every night they would play a Death Wish movie. And I would always hear my friends talking about it and making jokes. So one day I said, okay, I got to rent one of these. And I rented the first film because I knew Bronson just from all the advertisements from his Canon movies. But then I see that first film and I was just not somebody that watched 70s movies at that time, but I was like blown away by him, by the vibe of New York City in the 70s, the Herbie Hancock soundtrack and just you know, the essence of the man and how cool he was on screen that next thing you know, I started watching all the other movies and getting into his filmography. So Paul, um, do you remember the first time you saw a Bronson movie in the theaters? Yeah, the first Bronson movie I saw in the theaters was Breakout in 1975. I, uh, I grew up in the 1970s. I was, it was a great time to grow up. I grew in a town called Beverly, Massachusetts, a suburb of Boston. And there was a theater called the Cabot Cinema. It's actually still there. And it was a, back then the movies would play in the big cities. And then a few months later, they'd play in the smaller suburbs, a double feature. So I was able to walk to that theater. So when I was in elementary school, um, a friend of mine, we walked to see Breakout. This was in, in uh, I guess it was probably the spring of 1975. It may have been the fall, but that was the first time I saw Bronson on the screen was Breakout, the 1975 movie. Yeah, I saw Breakout on DVD probably 10 years ago. And for, I know the rating system was different in the way that movies were rated back then, but that ending where he fights the guy and he gets chopped up with the propeller, I'm like, there are no movies today that have balls like that anymore. Right. Yeah, yeah, that was great because, um, like you said, Andre, uh, this was before they had PG thirteen, so a lot of crazy stuff you get to see in the PG movie. So I was, uh, and as you said, I was I was very surprised. That was the most graphic thing I had seen at that time. Again, I was in elementary school, so um, it was definitely a su- surprise to see that one, to see that type of violence. And after Breakout, pretty much I became hooked on Bronson, and I saw. Some of them I didn't get to see because they didn't play, but pretty much every other Bronson movie after Breakout, I went and saw in the theater up until Death Wish 5, which was his last theatrical release. Um, What do you think made him appealing as an actor that was constantly doing a lot of character work in the 50s and the 60s? Obviously, we know his best work when he first started with films like The Great Escape and... um, the Dirty Dozen, Machine Gun Kelly, like just, you know, from the exploitation films he was in to, you know, the, the classics of that period. You know, what made him appealing? And then why is it that he didn't become a superstar until the first Death Wish, which by then he was already in his 50s? Right. Well, he came, it's, the interesting thing is, you know, people can be born and they can study acting, 
but you have to be born with that star quality. Every single actor who became a star, I think, was born with that uh, star quality. And one thing I think about Bronson is he came from a very poor background. He came from a family of coal miners. He himself was a coal miner in his youth. So he had that really hard, rough, creviced face, very unusual face, which made him stand out. And I think what got him started in the small parts in the 1950s, again, he had that very distinct, memorable face. If, for example, if they were casting some Westerns, they, of course, wanted a bunch of guys, but they wanted each of them to stand out, even the guys who just had small pots. So he definitely was somebody, I think, uh, the casting agents would walk into the room and they'd be like, oh, that's an interesting face. And then he just built the different characters and some of the uh, movies, like you mentioned, started doing the ensemble stuff in the 1960s, uh, The Dirty Dozen, The Great Escape, uh, Magnificent Seven, movies like that where they had a big cast, like The Magnificent Seven, they needed seven distinct guys, not just distinct in terms of how they were written in the script, but guys that the first time you see each of those guys, you're like, oh, that's an interesting looking guy. So as you follow him throughout the movie, he, they all stand out. And like you said, um, uh, you were asking like, it, yeah, it took him quite some time to become a star. He was very late. It wasn't until the late 60s he was well into his 40s when he became a star. So that was very, very late. And I think it was at that time, well, he became a big star first over in Europe. It was actually a while before he broke into the United States. Over in Europe, especially at that time, they were more interested in not necessarily the, the classically handsome type guys. A lot of the more uh, rugged type guys uh, were popular over there. Lino Ventura, uh, Jean-Paul Bel Belmondo, uh, I can't uh, draw a blank right now, but guys like that who were not necessarily classically handsome, but guys that stood out uh, with that type of appeal. And the interesting thing is when Bronson broke through over in Europe, he had male fans, of course, but he also had huge female fans. For example, Rider on the Rain, which was a movie made in the 1969, a French thriller. He's the lead in that. And that movie made him a huge sex symbol with the women over in France. And again, we're getting now into the early 1970s when uh, worldwide cinema, certainly American cinema, we were getting more into the gritty, realistic type stuff. You know, a lot of stuff was being shot on location. The audiences were looking for people who looked like somebody that you would see in the street, you know, somebody who really came from those streets. So when he started making those movies like uh, The Stone Killer, Mr. Majestic, and of course, Death Wish, things like that, that were set in uh, hardened environments. The audience saw him and believed him. And I think a lot of people also identify with him, you know, especially the men would look at him and say, hey, that guy kind of looks like me. I could identify with this kid or with this actor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's part of what Def Wish's appeal is because as you mentioned in your book, and your Bronson's Loose has so much trivia that if you don't even have to go on IMDb to find out the behind the scenes. Like, this is the guy that's done all the research. But people may not know that Def Wish was supposed to be a Sidney Lament movie. And he wanted somebody like Jack Lemmon or, you know, like just a character actor to play who was Paul Benjamin in the book before they renamed him Kersey. So, you know, when they cast Bronson, it seemed like obviously Michael Winter was involved at that point. They were trying to make it more of a Bronson type of picture, but it resonated at a time when the crime rate in New York City was ridiculously high, muggings were way up. So for an audience, especially in New York City, to see just this sort of middle upper class guy go out and kill muggers was just unbelievable. And just you wanted to root for this guy. There were probably audiences that were cheering left and right that it made these blockbuster numbers. Um, but, you know, the thing I will say that I really like about this film is that there's all those great moments of him going after muggers, but the scene that I think still stands out to me the most is when his son-in-law comes to the apartment. This is after he's done a couple of killings and he's like playing jazz music and he's cooking and he's like in this good mood. And the son was like saying, your daughter's still in the hospital. She's still like comatose and he snaps at him. There was some good subtle acting that I think is highly underrated 
in that film, you know, in his entire filmography. Yeah, absolutely. And um, like you said, Andre, uh, The Death Wish was based on a novel. The novel was not a bestseller at the time. And it took a long time for the movie to get made because many of the, they offered it to many, many name actors and they all turned it down. And without a name actor, it couldn't get made until Bronson was able to sign on. So it was at the time a very, uh, very strong, very unusual film. And I didn't grow up in New York. I grew up in Boston, which was, you know, not as rough, but I still growing up then, you know, it was it was a rough time. You saw heard a lot of stuff in the newspapers about the muggage. You'd see things on the news, and it was, certainly was a, a scary time in in some cities. So the film certainly reflected that. And one thing it's always interesting to me um, when the film was made. Bronson was an action superstar, so people who went and saw that movie, uh, they knew Bronson was going to take control. Uh, but it's interesting when I show that film now to people who don't know Bronson how it plays really as a different film almost because you don't know that he's going to, to snap like that. You really see this man, uh, you know, his anger really build. And as you said, lots of good moments for Bronson. In fact, uh, other, one scene in particular where after he shoots the first guy that he shoots, comes back home and he, and he throws up, you know, mm -hmm. so it's a very strong movie. As much as I, the sequels are all very entertaining, but in some ways, the sequels kind of uh, dissipated the power of that first one because the sequels became more comic book oriented, whereas that first one certainly is not. You know, when you sit down and watch that movie, there's really nothing, uh, there's nothing really laughable about that movie. That's a very strong movie. And in fact, you can see at the end, the famous image where he holds up his finger like a gun, mm -hmm. uh, showing that he's going to continue his vigilante ways. That's actually, you know, very chilling when you think about that, because this guy, um, it's really not a happy ending, because again, this guy has really been stripped of all his humanity. So this guy has really snapped and gone off the deep end. So we're talking, so it's a very, uh, very strong, scary uh, movie, a very strong character, like you said, a great character and really very well played by Bronson, certainly one of his best performances, a very un underrated performance. Yes. Um I, okay, my question is, uh, it's interesting something you just said, that like when you show it more to people now who don't know that much about Bronson, how they maybe can watch the film like in a different mindset than at the time when Death Wish came out, knowing Bronson, his reputation as, you know, on screen. I guess my question is, do you think that maybe now people can maybe, even though he's obviously an icon, cinematic icon to us, certain generation do you think maybe his films can more be reconsidered uh not necessarily the death wish sequels because everybody kind of knows what those are about but like maybe more of his films like again chato's land breakout do you think that more this next generation can more go into it with a more open mind because they don't necessarily know charles bronson the action hero they can look at it more as charles bronson the actor Yes, absolutely. And uh, like I said, as much as I like the sequels, they kind of uh, kind of like not just turn the series into a comic book, but also kind of turned Bronson into like this comic book action star. Certainly a lot of those canon films, as much as I love them, but again, they are very much over the top uh, comic book type movies. So when a lot of those people see those, when they see Bronson, they immediately think, oh, a silly action film. Whereas a lot of those early ones, uh, really stand on their own. You know, as always, the, the best, most important thing about a movie is the script. And he was working with a lot of good scripts back in that era. Uh, High Times, a fantastic script. Yep. Uh, Death Wish, a great script. Um, Mr. Majestic, uh, a, a great script. So he was working with some really good material back then. So like Jeff said, I would like to see a lot of these, especially younger people, um, also especially some uh, female film goers as well, would watch some of his earlier films um, with an open mind and just see that they actually work as actual uh, movies, not just a comic book extravaganza. That brings an interesting yeah, point. Yeah, because it seems yeah. like, 
Uh, no, I was just going to say, it seems like with the Death Wish films, it's sort of like while Stallone survived the Rambo movies, it's sort of like how First Blood is a little more, it's an action film, but it's a little more character driven and realistic right. than every Rambo after that is pretty much, you know, over the top, ridiculous slaughter fest. And in my limited, you know, a knowledge of the Death Wish films from the ones I've seen in clips and the history of it. It seems like after Death Wish, that is where the series kind of goes, where it gets a little more outlandish, a little more, you know, just on on the on the money side more than character side. And yeah, absolutely. They, and that happens a lot with all the series. It happens with uh, James Bond. You know, the early James Bond are a lot more realistic, realistic. Uh, Dirty Harry, certainly. That are, that first Dirty Harry, you know, still stands as a masterpiece. The later ones of those get really silly and over the top. And like you said, uh, a, a, another great example is the Rambo series. Like you said, that first one is a very uh, hardcore, serious, uh, scary type movie, whereas they have to continuously, um, I guess they have to keep drawing the audience in, of course. So the audience have seen that. They say, well, if I'm going to come back again, you better give me more. I need more stunts, more explosions, et cetera. So that happens a lot with a lot of um, uh, series. They have to keep getting, well, I guess they're trying to be better and better, but they really kind of dissipate what the original was. And we can even go even, even talk about, uh, well, nowadays we've got the Fast and the Furious. Look at that oh, first yeah. Fast and the Furious. <laughs> Look what they've become, you know. So they go to space know, now. Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> you know, we we uh, we used to joke about that. We say, oh, well, the next Fast and Furious is going to be in space, and here we are, you know. We, and then of course, well, Jason we made in space it. too. So, mm -hmm. but, all right. <laughs> um. So you know that also brings up another good point because in the seventies, guys like Clint Eastwood, Burt Reynolds, Robert Redford. They didn't just act in their pictures. They also had their hands on behind the scenes with the different directors that they chose to work with, handling the scripts, sometimes even directing themselves. Bronson didn't seem to do a lot of that, particularly after Death Wish, when he really had become a box office draw. It just seemed like he continued to take paycheck jobs that were pretty much either a Death Wish type movie or just something that was more within his range, like Breakout or Telethon, Love and Bullets. Um, was there anything... I mean, I, I would say maybe Hard Times is the closest thing to a passion project, but were there scripts that he really wanted to do that weren't just about the money? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one thing, again, you know, again, he reached his peak at such a late age, unlike, uh, at such older age, unlike Eastwood and uh, Stallone, uh, you know, Bronson was at a later stage when he started reaching his peak. So he, he didn't really want to um, lose his audience or break out of the mold, in other words. But he did get a tremendous amount of scripts, and he always did try to pick the best out of what he was sent. Uh, very, probably the strangest movie he ever made was uh, From Noon Till Three, which is a comic Western made in uh, 1976. And that was an interesting one, too, because that's something that they never would have thought to cast Bronson in. In fact, uh, they originally went after Jack Nicholson to star in that film. And just like Death Wish, when they couldn't raise the money, when they couldn't find a lead actor, it went to Bronson. And From Noon Till Three is a very strange, a comic Western. It flopped when it came out, and Bronson was hoping that him and his wife, Jill Island, starred in it. They were hoping that that was going to take them to another level, acting-wise, project-wise, but unfortunately, it did not. And Bronson actually had aspirations of directing. There was a, a project he worked on for a long time in the 1970 called A Dollar 98. Him uh, and Jill Island wrote it. And then several uh, notable screenwriters worked on different drafts. Bronson was going to direct that. It was set in the Depression. And it was an autobiographical film, almost, in which Bronson played a coal miner and Jill Island was going to be in it, too. And so that was a project he was really interested in. For example, Hard Times is also set in that era. That's yeah. one of the reasons why he liked Hard Times. But um, Dollar 98 worked on it for a long time. Different um, people were attached to it. Unfortunately, that never got made. So uh, it, uh, answer your question. Yes, he did have aspirations of directing and taking a more behind the scenes uh, 
control, but you know, did not ultimately. So. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that would change his career tra trajectory. You know, it would have just probably put him on a different level than the path of the canon films. Right. Yeah. And interesting, later in his life, he did do some interesting character type stuff. He did a television film called Act of Vengeance that was made for HBO, in which he plays a union leader. It's a true story. And he was hoping that that was going to uh, branch him out more into like some uh, supporting roles in bigger films, but it did not. And then uh, late in life, he did some interesting stuff. Uh, the Sean Penn film, The Indian Runner, he has a small part in that. Uh, mm -hmm. Very good part in that. And then he did some television films. Uh, yes, Virginia, There is a Santa Claus. Yeah, unusual that. film for him. And The Sea Wolf, which is based on the Jack London story. Again, a strong character part for him. So later in life, he was able to do some offbeat character work. But never, unfortunately, never was able to approach um, his full potential, you know, as, as an actor. He never got a, uh, as good a role as he should have gotten during his heyday during his, that big era, so. Yeah, so sort of like Burt Rent, late career Burt Reynolds almost. And exactly right. right. Yeah, do you think that the later films he did in the 90s were a result of his wife's passing? Because I know that certainly had a profound effect on him. When you see him in The Indian Runner and he's mourning his wife in that scene where he's looking at the home movies, that's really how he was feeling at that moment. So you think that kind of changed his career tra trajectory in that late stage? Yeah, absolutely. You know, during that, uh, another an interesting project that he did have to turn down, um, I'm drawing a blank right now, I can't remember the name, but it, it was a made for cable Western and ultimately starred uh, Chris Christophus and it was produced by Lance Houle who had produced 10 to Midnight and Cabo Blanco mm -hmm. and some other Bronson films. It was a, it's a really good, um, like I said, I, I'm drawing a blank right now, but it's a, a made for cable Western that starred Chris Christopherson. That was offered to Bronson. He had to turn it down because uh, Jill Island, his wife, was very ill at the time and he didn't want to be away from her. During that final era when his wife was very ill, that's why a lot of those canon movies are set in Los Angeles because, again, he didn't want to be away from his wife. You know, he didn't want to have to travel, whereas that Western would have had to take him. Um, I think they shot it in Colorado. So that's why he turned that down. But that's an example there. That's a very good Western that, um, that again, would have showed his range at that era in his life. And then when his wife got really sick, he stopped working for a few years. So that stalled his career then. And then he came back with the Indian runner. He was offered that role. And again, turned it down initially because he wasn't ready to go back yet. But some friends uh, convinced him to it. And as you said, gave a, it's a very small role, but it's a very... Uh, memorable, powerful role. One of the very few films he made without his mustache, actually, once he hit his peak. So, yeah, he got a standing ovation at Cannes when it premiered. That's right. Yeah, when he went to the premiere with Sean Penn and uh, got a, a very long standing ovation uh, when that when the film was shown. Correct. I want to circle back to Death Wish 2, because there's a question I have for you that I think you did cover in your book, but it's been a while since I've looked at it. Mm -hmm. I remember online one day, I saw what was, I guess, one of these posters that they usually put out at cons when they're trying to sell a movie that hasn't been shot yet. And the original poster for Death Wish 2 had him in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. So I guess it was supposed to be in San Francisco. Why did it change from San Francisco to Los Angeles? Yeah, the original script was for Death Wish 2 was set in San Francisco. And the reason why to um, make it different from the first one, instead of being in New York, now it's set in San Francisco. And to give it kind of like a good flavor, because you've got um, in the background, you've got this, you know, pretty town of legendary town of San Francisco with this horrible violence taking place in front of it. And, and it was changed, uh, needless to say, for budget reasons, of course, it was much cheaper to shoot in Los Angeles. That's where most of the, the crews were. It wasn't uh, not as much travel involved. You know, they would have had to put the cast and crew ups in, in San Francisco. So it was changed for uh, budget reasons. And a lot of scenes, um, but the only thing that was changed uh, was the location. The script itself didn't change. They just changed certain scenes that were set um, in a park in San Francisco were now set in a park in Los Angeles, so. And, uh, 
long answer or short answer to your question for budget reasons is why it was changed from San Francisco to Los Angeles. All right. Okay. Um, I just read the book, uh, you know, so I have like, it's a wonderful written book. It made me more interested in the films than I probably ever would have been because I find probably more of the behind the scenes stories more interesting than the actual plots of some of the sure. films. Sure. Uh, I want to ask you, why in particular was like, I, you've written books, you know, about other subjects, but why was the Death Wish film franchise of so much interest to you in particular? Okay. Yeah, the thing is, I usually uh, only write when I have to. What that means is sometimes I'll see a movie, I'll be like, hey, what's the story behind that? And I can find a book about it. Death Wish, I could not find a book about it. I says, well, I have to find this out myself. And it started... Um, one day I watched the original Death Wish. I hadn't seen it in many years. I sat down and watched it. Uh, and again, I was older, I was younger when I first saw it. I was older, so you see it differently. I sat down and watched the first Death Wish. And I was like, wow, that's a really good movie. I'd forgotten how good that was. And again, the, the, the memory of the sequels had kind of dissipated how powerful that first one was. And I had not seen the sequels in a while either. So I said, I'm going to have a marathon. I'm going to watch two, three, four, and five. And this was before any of them were on DVD. So I had to find VHS copies at several mom and pop stores. So I sat down one day and had a marathon of two, three, four, and five. And I was like, this is crazy. How did we get from this first movie to part five, especially when they're all completely different, especially since the first three are made by the same director, but they're, but they're like, completely different movies. So I said, I got to find this story out. So that's why I said, and again, I couldn't find any books about the Death Wish series or even any articles. So I said, I got to find this story out myself. So that's what started it. Okay, and thank you. <laughs> yeah, I actually have a question about Death Wish story because I mean that it's the cult classic out of all of them that yeah. if you ever talk about that movie, people quote the giggler line and, yeah. you know, they remember all the different moments. I'm going to kill an old lady for you. Like all that crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you something that I don't think you probably get enough questions about, and it involves the wildy magnum that he uses. So almost everything Def Wish related even like the DVD art for the first film has the wildy magnum in it, even though it's not in the movie. So I guess my question for you is, because it was so popular with that particular film, was there any reason why it was never brought back in the sequels, like four and five? I, it was because I think they wanted a different gun each time. The other thing, interesting thing is, every single movie he uses a different gun. When they were making Death Wish 3, uh, that Wildy gun had just come out. It was, again, again, this is before the internet. So you would have to find out about these new guns through fellow gun collectors or through gun magazines. Michael Winter had heard about that gun. And in fact, actually, let me correct that. Um, the guy who wrote Death Wish 3, I'm drawing a blank, Michael Edmonds, I think is his name. Yeah, I think he, it was Don Jacoby, but he changed his name for credits. Yeah, what is it? I think it was... Uh, uh, you're right. Okay, Don Jacoby, you're right. Yeah, he, he wrote Life Force. Yes, yeah, right. He took a pseudonym. When Don Jacoby was writing Death Wish 3, he had heard about the Wildy Gun, so he wrote that into the script. In the script, he has that. And then he convinced Michael Winter, says, we have to actually put this gun into the movie. So they actually hired uh, the Wildy guy who invented the gun. He was hired to, you know, make the gun for the movie, not the, uh, you know, a gun that could fire blank cartridges. So that's... Um, that's how the world he got in part three. And then I think for the other ones, I, and then of course, why it's not in four and five, they wanted to use um, a different piece of machinery, you know, a different type of gun. And I guess one thing they did in part four that made it different was he uses several different weapons throughout that film. So I think that's one of the reasons why they didn't use the world he was to be different. And again, that the, the gimmick for part four is that he uses multiple weapons throughout the film. So. And speaking of part four, so when I first read your book, obviously all the trivia was eye-opening and there were some things that I had already known about, but mm -hmm. the fourth one in particular is what really blew me away because I thought there were all these different unproduced ideas, but there was one that I thought 
if they had made this movie, this probably would have been the definitive Death Wish sequel. So I want you to talk about that a little bit, which is bringing back Jill Ireland's character from two and then him, you know, how that ties in with like him wanting to give up the vigilante life until something tragic happens. Right. Um, and it's in the Death Wish uh, series, you know, each, each entry from two on, they had multiple ideas, multiple treatments, multiple scripts that they developed while it was going on. For part four, they had uh, several different ideas. One was in uh, Gail Morgan Hickman, a screenwriter who wrote part four. He also wrote uh, the Clint Eastwood movie, The Enforcer. He had a, a long career. Uh, but Gail Morgan Hickman, when he wrote, started to get the idea for part four, he wanted to go back to some of the original ones. So he brought back Jill Island's character from part two. And Kersey uh, finds her again, says, hey, I'm a changed man. I'm done with the vigilante. So they get back together and she gets killed. And that of course uh, sets off his vigilante ways again. He first gets the idea, he lures, she's killed by a gang. He lures this gang to a warehouse that he's rigged with all these traps and he doesn't kill them. These traps just capture them. So he, he calls the police and there's a big trial and he's, but they're set free. The criminals are all set free. So that sets him off again and says, hey, I tried to do this without killing them. The system let me down once again. So he's back to be in the vigilante. And I, the reason it was changed is because again, at the time, Jill Island was, um, her cancer had come back. So they did not want to, uh, she did not want to play a character who got killed. So that's one of the reasons why that premise was, was dropped. An interesting thing, uh, one, another thing that was dropped about pot four, um, Bronson's girlfriend in that film is played by Kay Lenz. That film was going to end with showing that Kay Lenz was going to team up with Curse. And so for the next film, it was going to be a, a man and uh you know, a vigilante and his girlfriend on the streets taking people down, but they decided to uh, drop that in because again, they just decided there'd be too much of a change of formula, you know, to take him, to change it from a lone wolf into a, you know, a partnership, a right. male female partnership. So. Another thing about your book too is like, you also do talk a little bit about his private life and everything that I read is pretty much he was very private. Sometimes he was standoffish and sometimes he would kind of mellow out and be able to talk to his co-workers. But most of the time he was very guarded unless Jill Ireland was on the set. Um, are you aware of like any close friendships he had in the industry? Because there's a lot of like people that you would see him associated with, but nobody that, you know, he was like really tight knit with. Yeah, I think it's kind of uh, interesting about interesting about Bronson is you know he as we said he came from the you know rock bottom, and most of the people that he stayed friends with were people that he met before he was famous. Interesting thing, uh, Jack Klugman, the legendary character actor who probably best known for the Odd Couple TV series and the Quincy TV series, Bronson and Jack Jack Klugman were roommates together in Philadelphia before they became famous, they were struggling actors. So they stayed friends forever. And uh, another man named Joe Roman, who actually got Bronson into acting, he, Bronson was in a gym one day in Philadelphia and met a guy named Joe Roman. Joe Roman suggested they take, that he take an acting class. So that got Bronson to acting. Joe Roman appears in small parts in many of the Bronson films, uh, St. Ives, and uh, the White Buffalo are two examples. So he stayed friends with him. And there's a lot of actors you'll see in, in some of the commentary tracks I've done, I point them out. You see a lot of actors in bit parts who had been friends with Bronson for decades and Bronson would get them small roles in his films because of course they were actors who had nowhere near the success they did. And especially as they got older, they needed to get the roles so they could build up their credits with the Screen Actors Guild so they could keep their medical insurance. So a lot, of, most of his friendships were people he met before he was a star. I think he was kind of off, he didn't like people who wanted to be friends with him just because he was famous and 
mm. and things like that. But he did stay acquainted with a lot of people. Every year in Hollywood, at his mansion, him and Jill Island would have a big Christmas party. And many people who had been in his movies would show up. I know Telly Savalas was there, uh, Lee Marvin, uh, Ernest Borgnine. So a lot of them, he stayed at least in touch with them. And uh, George C. Scott was one of his neighbors, lived close by, and he always came to the Christmas party too. So, but yeah, to answer your question, I don't think he, he did not really keep too many close friends among the, the Hollywood elite, in other words. So like, if you saw him, like when he was at that Clint Eastwood spe TV special or when he showed up at the premiere of Michael Jackson's Kept, you know, he was actually paid to just show up. He wasn't a real fan. Well, I think the funny thing is, um, you know, Clint Eastwood, I think, well, he was there. Um, I think for those things like that, he wasn't paid to show up like the Clint Eastwood thing. And of course, him and Eastwood did work together on an episode of Rawhide. Yeah. And pre-Stardom, they did have some social interaction. So I think for the Clint Eastwood thing, uh, he wanted to be there. When he's there for the Captain EO, a lot of that is, you know, the celebrities will do that. You know, people will try to arrange a crowd of celebrities. So they'll contact different people. Hey, do you want to do this? Are you available? So I don't know if he watched, he may not even watch the whole movie. You know, a lot of these people will show up for the premiere and uh, kind of, oh, they'll show up for a nightclub or something, wave to the crowd, go inside, and then just go out the back door. So be interesting to see. I don't, I, I, I like to think that he probably liked the Captain EO movie. I don't know. Maybe he wasn't a huge Michael Jackson fan, but he probably said what he probably sat down, put the 3D glasses on, enjoyed the show. You know, so I mean, I, I just laugh because I remember when Michael Jackson died and they're showing like all these clips and they're showing the premiere of Captain EO. And the last thing they show was him with Jill Ireland being interviewed by Entertainment Tonight. And he says, Oh, I'm a big fan of Michael Jackson. I want to see what he's doing. We got to remember, uh, you know, when Bronson was big in the early 70s that's when the jackson five were huge so he probably saw him on the ed sullivan show and enjoyed the music who knows you know and jill island of course was the opposite of bronson she was very much a people person she yeah. loved to talk to people so i think she also um would convince him to come to these things you know because she'd be like oh we got invited to go see the michael jackson 3d movie let's go to that so he would you know go along with it so i i, I would like to think that Bronson liked the Captain Neo movie, you know, I mean, it, it's certainly, up, you know, it's a action movie, so. Yeah, I mean, if she liked it, he probably did, I would think. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and probably something too, you know, his kids, uh, you know, at the time, at that time, you know, his, at least his daughter was still a teenager, she was probably a Michael Jackson fan, mm, and yeah. she probably got to go with him, so stuff like that, you know, you bring your kids along or something like that, if you don't want to go, uh, you, if you, you know, I mean, you might not want to go to a baseball game, but if the kid wants to go, you'll go. So I don't. Know. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, okay. Uh, oh, so did you have a question, or do you want? Okay. Uh, I do, but you, you go ahead, Jeff. Okay. Um, this is a little bit off a uh, subject, but you know, obviously, uh, and it was inevitable that they make a Death Wish remake of sorts. You know, starring Bruce Willis, who I guess they want to consider the. Charles Bronson of today. <laughs> so I was wondering, did you have any thoughts on that movie? Obviously not the cinematic classic the original was, but did you think maybe the remake did a little justice? Did it try or was it just an, a cash in? Or what were your thoughts on it? Mm. Yeah, one thing that we kind of touched on earlier that I, I forgot to mention was, you know, we were saying the sequels kind of uh, diminished the power of the first one. Something else that diminished the power of the first one was, you know, Death Wish was the first really big vigilante movie. And it was ripped off by so many other vigilante movies that because of that, it kind of loses its power. You know, you, it's not only is it hard to find somebody to sit down and watch the first Death Wish who has not seen a Bronson movie, but also somebody who has not seen a vigilante movie, you know. So the power of the vigilante theme has been kind of diminished. So I did not watch that uh, remake i didn't want to the reason why i was looking forward to it because i read the script beforehand i think i think um i think andre got the script to me or andre yeah joe garnahan wrote it uh, yeah that it that had been posted online before while it was stalled yeah. you know who wrote that a famous guy wrote it. joe carnahan yeah and he was going to direct it i think originally too yeah but um i did not like 
the script at all. I was very disappointed because it was one of those ones where it's almost like they just bought the Death Wish title because that script has nothing to do with the original or even the original book. It's almost like they just got the rights of the Death Wish title so they could make an official Death Wish ripoff. So, and then uh, Eli Roth, the director, I was not a fan of his work and Bruce Willis, uh, even at that time, now he's does 5,000 movies a year, but even during the Death Wish remake, he was kind of, you know, played out like he really didn't care anymore. So I didn't, and then I saw the trailer too. And I couldn't even finish watching the trailer. They were playing the ACDC song. So I was like, they have no, they, they don't understand the movie at all. So uh, long answer to your question. I did not want, I did not watch that remake. I did not want to. So I never watched the remake. I wish they had gone to, and again, they probably can't do this for commercial reasons, but if they're going to do a remake, they should have gone back to that original novel. That's what we need to see. And they could do that on a low budget, you know, especially now they could make it, you know, direct for streaming, you know, put it, premiere it on Netflix or something like that. But I guess because that Death Wish name now stands for uh, garish, over-the-top vigilante movie, they, they couldn't do that. They have to make, uh, you know, a silly, over-the-top vigilante movie. So, um, and also, did you, uh, in particular, see uh, Death Sentence, uh, the sequel yeah. to Death Wish that starred uh, Kevin Bacon eventually, like, you know, 20 years later? And what did you think of that film if you did see it? Yeah, the thing is, I actually, um, Death Sentence, of course, Brian Garfield, who wrote the original Death Wish novel, he did not like the Death Wish movie. He hated it. He thought it went against what the novel stood for. You know, he said the novel stands for uh, vigilanteism is not the answer, it's another problem. So he was very unhappy with the original Death Wish movie. So he wrote Death Sentence, the sequel novel, as an answer to that. And in the sequel novel, uh, Paul Benjamin, uh, the vigilante's name in the, in the book series, Paul Benjamin um, backs away from being a vigilante. Meanwhile, there's a copycat out there, vigilante, who's killing everybody, killing all kinds of uh, minor muggers, you know, shoplifters and stuff like that. So Paul Benjamin goes after this new copycat vigilante to try to convince him that, hey, this isn't the answer, this isn't the way to go. So when they made that death sentence move with Kevin Bacon, that was another example of what I said. That was just an excuse. They just bought the death sentence title so they could make an unofficial remake of Death Wish because that death sentence movie has absolutely nothing to do with um, the novel. So it's, a, it's not at all related to the death sentence novel. And I had read that script um, before it was shot as well. And I was not impressed with that script either. I thought it was a, a well-structured, competent script, but it was no, nothing, anything brilliant. Um, I did go see that film because I liked James Wan, the director. Yeah, and I yeah. liked, and that film was pretty good. I thought that was a good example of a mediocre script being lifted up by strong direction and strong performance. You know, Kevin Bacon is always good. He's fantastic in that movie. And John Goodman was good in a very atypical uh, role for him. So, yeah, he was very good. Yeah, so another long answer to your question. I did like that Death Sentence movie, even though, again, it was nothing to do with uh, the original book, and it was just a, uh, an excuse to make, another, to make another remake of Death. Yeah, so um, I want to also talk to you about your process when you write your two books. Um, you get all these great interviews. I mean, you got Michael Winter when he was still alive. You've gotten a number of Bronson's collaborators and, you know, crew members that worked on his films. What was the process like to contact those people and to get them involved? Right, well, what started it... Um... When I was doing the first book, again, I had that marathon and I said, I got to find out the story behind this. So I decided at first I was just going to write a magazine article about the first three films. I said, well, there's no point in doing this if I can't get a Michael Winner interview. If I don't get an interview with him, there's no point in doing this. So I was able to track down uh, his phone number, no, his, his, his mailing address online. I can't remember where I found it, but uh, I wrote to that, you know, sent a snail mail to, to London where he lived. And his uh, assistant uh, sent me an email back and said, Mr. Winner will speak to you on this date at this time. And, you know, I was so ecstatic. And then because of the time difference, 
I can't remember what the time difference was, but the time he gave me was something like 5.30 in the morning, my time. So I had to, you know, get up and be prepared to talk to him at 5.30 in the morning, have my questions all ready. It was a fantastic interview. I recorded it. We spoke for a little over an hour and he was a great uh, interviewer. He has fantastic story. He's a hilarious guy. So I got this fantastic interview with Michael Winner, wrote an article about the three uh, Death Wish films, uh, sent a query to all these magazines. Uh, nobody was interested in even reading the magazine, reading the article. So I said, okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a book about all of the movies. So I tried to track down as many people as I could. Um, and again, I had really no credentials at the time. So most of the time people uh, were probably like, who is this guy? He's probably never going to finish it. I'm just going to waste my time. But I was fortunate. A lot of people did talk to me. Of course, a lot of people did not, but I got a good core group to put in the book. So what I always do when I find these people, you know, I try to break the whole process down. When did they first uh, get attached to the project? Had they seen the original, the earlier Death Wish films? What did they think of them? What were they trying to do with this new product? Uh, any interesting stories that happened uh, during the production? What did they think about the film when it was finished? And what did they think about the film now and how and also another important question is how do they think it affected their career did it uh enhance diminish or have no effect at all on their career so yeah, yeah and you know that's the thing too like reading it and you get little anecdotes from other interviews that some of these actors did and the next question i have for you is like obviously bronson's no longer with us there's no way of getting an interview with him but um there's a part of me that as I'm reading Bronson's Loose, it's kind of like, I want to hear about Lawrence Fishburne's experience, Jeff Goldblum is Mugger 1 or 2, and Alex Winner. Right. Were there interviews you tried to get that you wish you could have gotten? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, uh, well, one thing I want to say, you know, an important thing is that we have, it's important that we track these people down and interview them at whenever possible, and even... On a personal level, it's important that we interview like our family and stuff like that, because otherwise we get older and we want to know more about our family history, but the people are gone. So with film history, it's very important or, or any type of history, we talk to these people naturally while they're still alive, but also while they're still uh, have their mental facilities and when it's not too far away from when they did this stuff. So you know, you, we got to realize if we try to, you try to remember stuff from your childhood, you get things wrong sometimes. Too. So the farther away from the time, the, the less of this, uh, the, the truth gets lost or the, you know, the details get lost. So there were many, many people I wanted to interview. Um, naturally, Herbie Hancock, I tried to mm -hmm. find him, uh, wrote to him through several outlets, same with Jimmy Page, of course, who did the score for part two. Needless to say, I had no credentials at the time, so I made uh, couldn't get through to them. And obviously people that famous who are still doing work, they're assaulted 24 hours a day with people wanting to interview them. So those are two examples there. Um, trying to think who else, any particular ones. Uh, I guess those are the two main ones from the Death Wish series that I was not able to reach that I wanted to. Um, fortunately, one of probably one of my favorites, of course, is Michael Winner. I'm very fortunate I spoke with him while he was still alive because he's a filmmaker who I think is very underrated. Of course, he, yeah. in his later career, he did some, uh, you know, over the top type stuff. But his early work up, you know, including Death Wish, he did some fantastic, really important stuff in that in that era of his, of his life. And the thing that did the death, my second book, Bronson's Loose Again, I got the idea, I said, I'm going to try to find every single person who's still alive who worked with him. So that was my goal with that film. Fortunately, I had more uh, research skills at the time. And having done the first book, that gave me more credibility, you know, being able to tell people, hey, I'm doing a sequel. They could research me, look me up and say, okay, this guy did do a book. Uh, he probably will finish this second one and get it out there. So, yeah. On a side note, too, speaking of Herbie Hancock, so I did actually 
get you trivia a while back when I read his biography and there was a section talking about his recording sessions for Def Witch. So I thought that was pretty cool. Him talking with Michael Winter through all the scenes. So you had that at least if you ever needed to exactly, yeah. write a third book That's at right. some point. And, and say with uh, Jimmy Page also did an autobiography in which he talks about uh, his Death Wish 2 score. So, you know, again, um, that information is out there. I wasn't able to put it in my book, but, you know, the, the information is out there. So. And I thought it was funny in your book when you said that the people at Canon wanted Isaac Hayes to do Death Wish 2. I'm like, that would have been weird, <laughs> but I would have loved to have heard that. Right. Same right. here. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's the interesting thing about that is they, um, I don't know if Canon, Canon wanted um, Isaac Hayes. I don't know how far they got along uh, approaching him, but Michael Winner, um, his next door neighbor was Jimmy Page. He had never met him before, but one day he walked over there and said, do you want to do this? You know, and he had never done a score before, but that's how he approached him. But that would have been interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. It'd be interesting to see what Isaac Hayes would have added to uh, part two. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, also, I want to talk a little bit about your audio commentaries, because I mean, I love like watching the Deaf Wish films and even some of the other Bronson movies like The Mechanic and uh, there's a few others you did. I can't think of them all right now, but uh, just the way you go through the trivia of each scene, the production, I'm thankful that you did the commentary for Deaf Wish 3 because now I know what was New York and what was London because that was confusing me for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And I fell off the floor with this one bit you did on Death Wish 5 about his maid, which I'm not going to repeat here, but it's like the most hilarious thing ever. <laughs> if, I'll, I'll have to give it to you, Jeff. I'll, one of these days, it's like region two. You know, the, you know. Anyway, so um, are there any commentary tracks you haven't done yet that you would like to do? Because I know I would love to see you do Death Wish 1, but Paramount, they're sticklers. Are there any other Bronson movies that you would do a commentary for? Yeah, let's see, I just, um, I think, uh, I think I just finished, I think it was my 13th, maybe my 14th Bronson commentary track. I just finished um, Violent City, which will be out in May of 2022. And then The White Buffalo, which will be sometime in late 2022. Um, I've been fortunate, a lot of um, the ones that I really wanted to do, I was able to do the commentary for. Um, let me think which ones I haven't done that I would like. Oh, Hard Times, I would love to do that. Mm -hmm. Even though there is a great um, a, a, a British Blu-ray, which is fantastic, which has interviews with Walter Hill and interviews with um, the producer, Lawrence Gordon. I still would like to do a commentary for that because a lot of stuff I could fill in the blanks. You know, I like to fill in the blanks of well, what was cut out of the script at this point. I like to point out actual locations. Of course, Hard Times was filmed on location in New Orleans. So I like to point out uh, the different locations and things like that. So Hard Times is one of them. Uh, and there's a couple other ones that I get offered the commentary tracks all the time, but they usually, I have to turn them down because they don't give me enough time. I always tell them I need three months to prepare a commentary track because I, need everything. I have to track down the scripts, track down the novel it's based on, try to track down any bios, uh, press releases and stuff like that. So in order to fill up all that time and I'm doing it a good way, I need a lot of prep time to do it. So I won't say the names, but there's a lot of ones that I wanted to do that I had to turn down because I didn't have enough time. Uh, let's try to think. Um, I might be able to say, did you do Murphy's Law? I did not. Unfortunately, again, I was offered that one, but I had to turn it down because they didn't give me enough time. But I would uh, love to have done that one because yeah. I have lots of information about that one. I did a chapter on that one in um, uh, Bronson's Loose again yeah. in that book. And then I have um, I have like a script of that film. So I could that would be a really good one. I could fill in the blanks and say this was supposed to happen here. This is supposed to happen there. Stuff like that. So. Yeah, oh, about wanted, that. Did you get did you get to go to any of those locations ever, Andre, in Brooklyn that Death Wish 3 is at? I feel like I've crossed them a few times and I didn't realize there okay. were those locations. I think there was okay. one down, like my grandmother used to live on Ocean and Beverly. And usually when my parents would drop me off, they would go down Prospect Parkway. And okay. I almost feel like they shot there because the houses look similar to where there's like that big explosion during the cops shooting out with the gang. 
Uh, so I, I'm probably familiar with it. Jeff might know it better than I do. He's right. more of a Brooklynite than me. Right. <laughs> All right. And uh, uh, I was going to ask you too, uh, are there any other actors or film series that you would like to write on in the future? Yeah. Um, of course, I would love to do uh, a, a, a death wish. I mean, not a death wish, a dirty Harry book. Yeah. I'd love to do that. Uh, problem is, I did some preliminary stuff. And of course, the thing is, if I can't get a Clint Eastwood interview, there's really no point in doing it. Because of course, I could just see it now, um, put the book out there with no Eastwood interview. That's all anyone's going to say. He didn't interview Clint Eastwood. Why didn't you interview Clint Eastwood? You know, so I. You know that that's one thing stopping me there. Uh, but there's a couple other ones I would like to do. The problem is I just I don't know if I could um, uh, get the contacts to do it. You know, that's that you know, get the interviews to do it. So there's uh, several I would like. Of course, I would love to do the Rambo series. Mm -hmm. I would love to do uh, uh, Lethal Weapon would be another one that would be interesting because that of course is. Uh, that series went on for quite some time with a lot of different stories behind that. In fact, they're talking about doing. I think. Uh, I think they're doing a lead. They're talking about doing a lead weapon five. I don't know. Yeah, Mel Gibson's going to direct it. Okay, so they are definitely going to do it. Or is that you know if that's? It's it was announced. I think Richard Wenk is writing the script from an okay. idea Donner had. But again, they just announced these things. I don't know if it's serious or not, or if anybody even wants one. Right. Right. So, all right. I would like to see you write about Stallone because we always talk about Nighthawks, and that's a movie I want trivia right. about. <laughs> Right. Yeah, because I saw, um, I've been a huge Stallone fan since day one. I remember on the Dinah Shore show, uh, my mother and I were watching that, and Stallone was on there talking about Rocky. And this, again, this is before the internet, so you didn't you only knew about a movie from the TV commercials or from the talk show. So I saw that, and we went and saw the first Rocky, and I worshipped that movie. I was elementary school at the time, and I worship that movie at the time. So I followed everything Stallone did. And like you said, Nighthawks is a fantastic one. You know, with all, I, like you, I love the stuff that's shot on actual locations. I love that st stuff shot in New York in the 1970s, you know, into the early 80s, that early um, when New York was, was New York. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not like Def Wish 5, where they shoot exteriors of FAO Schwartz and that he's inside like a small KB toy store. Like, what yeah, the right. hell are you doing? Yeah. And, they, and that one too, they, oh, they'll, they'll just have, he'll be walking a street in Toronto and they'll sh show an actual street sign in New York. It's like, why did you, why didn't you just, you know, say it's, don't say where it takes place, be what you care, you know, when you're trying, they try to make that one in New York. It's like, what is this? So. Well, I mean, the Netflix Daredevil series also is just as guilty as that. We've talked about how they'll set up a street corner that's famous and then it's not the exact street from New York City, even though they shoot here. It's crazy. Right. Yeah. yeah, they did that with uh, the Spencer for Hire TV series, uh, which I love. That was yeah. shot entirely on location in Boston. Then later they did some TV movies. And of course, for cost, they had to film them in Toronto, but still set in Boston. It's like, no, 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 no. And finally, the later ones, they just set them in Toronto. They said, we're not even going to try to pass this off as Boston. So that's, that's and the funny thing is, done. I went to college in Boston, so I lived near the com, and I know all those spots, right. Five Leads Basement and all that you right. see in the opening titles. Right, right. <laughs> so it's like, but that, that's, they should know with Death Wish 5, they should have just, don't even try to pass it off as New York, you know. So. Yeah, it would be cool if you went to Europe instead. That would have been different. Yeah. 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 Um, you mentioned some of the commentaries you have coming up. Are there any books that you've written or anything, other projects that you have in the works? Yeah, I would like to do right now. I just, this past year has been really busy. One thing I did, um, a Spanish uh, publisher has just put out my two Bronson books. What we did for that, I took the two books uh, combine them, put them into chronological order, and split it in half into two volumes. And of course, there was a lot of work because there was a lot of uh, crossover information. So I had to sort all that out. And I added some additional chapters. So that came out in Spain. It's actually called, instead of called Bronson's Loose, because it didn't really translate, it's called Bronson's Law. So the Spanish version, La, what's it say? It's a uh, La Loi de Bronson, which means Bronson's Law. 
So it, I put a lot of time into that. And then I've been doing all those commentary tracks because I get off of those a lot. And that's what everybody seems to like. You know, they like, they'd rather listen than read. Right. So everybody likes those, me to do those commentary tracks. And right now I'm taking, um, I'm taking three months off from anything. I'm just going to, I'm going to study for three months. I got a stack of books I'm going to read. I got a stack of Blu-rays and a bunch of stuff lined up on streaming. And then I'm going to get back and do a project. And I would like, I'm probably going to do, I have the preliminary work for Bronson's Loose Volume 3. Mm. So I'm going to do another book combining some of the stuff that I didn't, uh, the movies that I uh, didn't write about in the earlier books. A lot of it is the information that was in uh, commentary tracks. And I did, I'm doing a really good one on the White Buffalo. Like I said, I'm doing a, I just did a commentary track for White Buffalo. I'm working on a really good chapter on the White Buffalo because I interviewed Pancho Koner, the producer of that film, and told me some fantastic stories. I've always loved that movie and I've always been fascinated with the story behind it. So that movie has an interesting uh, backstory to it. And kind of like what Jeff said um, earlier, you know, a lot of the stuff I write about, it's not, uh, you know, not just the movie I like, but the story behind it is what's yeah. important. You know, that's always happens. A lot of movies, you, a movie you like, the story behind it isn't all that interesting. You know, everything seemed to go well while they're making it. It's these ones that were troubled productions, you know, that mm -hmm. the fascinating story behind it. How do we get there? I'm always interested in how scripts develop, what actors were originally offered, directors get fired, you know, stuff like that. Stuff that was changed in editing. Did they reshoot some scenes? Did they cut a bunch of stuff out? Add narration, things like that. So I'm always fascinated by the entire filmmaking process. So. Yeah, same here. I'm always like looking for the backstories on all these films. And you certainly yeah. have provided a lot of great depth to all of those movies. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, do you have any questions as we wrap up? Um, not many questions. I just want to thank you for being interviewed. Thank you for writing these books, because like I said, most likely I probably might have gotten to Charles Bronson movies eventually, but just through reading your books, it makes me a lot more interested in watching movies and learning as much as I can about him. Because uh, unfortunately, even at this stage in my life, He's a, more of an icon in the background who I've heard a lot about, but I've never actually sat and watched his films. So okay. I want to thank you for writing those books and thank you for sitting down and talking to us. Great. Well, thank you guys for reading those books because, you know, a tremendous amount of work goes into them. Writing is a lonely process, researching. So it's always good that somebody actually uh, is reading it and, uh, and enjoying it and hopefully learning from it. Uh, also absolutely um where can people find you if they want to follow you on social media okay i have a facebook page called bronson's loose again so a facebook page called bronson's loose again i started that page to promote the second book and what i do on that page is i when it, when it, sometimes it's just an image of bronson i'll find i'll post that other times i'll have some time to write a little bit of uh trivia and something like that. So that I use that to announce my projects coming up. And I also use it whenever I see an interesting Bronson image or a, a Bronson bit of trivia that I like to share. And I always enjoy doing that because I like to have the fans um, put their comments underneath it, you know, if they what their opinion is of a certain movie or what they've learned, things like that. Awesome. Yeah. And we'll be sure to put the Amazon links down below in the comments. Uh, so yeah, Paul, thank you again for doing this. I really enjoy your work and I'm just looking forward to more of what you're going to do in the future. Great. Great. Definitely. All right. Thank you guys.